put people first. Which people are we even talking about? Have we identified those people? Who are those marginalized people who have no health care? Forget about diagnostics. And today, if we have been able to take a few steps forward, I would say if those 60, 70 percent are the identified people who do not have adequate health care, let us reach out to them. Let us reach out to them with technologies that are adequate, that are as, as good, as good at, and at par with the very best, because living a healthy life need not be a political thing. It is a fundamental right of any individual. It is his or her body. It is your body versus my body, Bobby. And if your body deserves the treatment that it deserves, so does mine. Whether you're in the global south or in the global north. And in major uh, of the African uh, continent, especially the sub-Saharan African region, the maximal uh, cases of HIV, TB co-infections tell you that People get infected with HIV, but at the end of the day, they die of TB. So all the more reason that we should have tools again right at the doorstep of those 60, 70 percent of those marginalized last mile people, communities which hitherto would never had the opportunity to get quality diagnostic solutions uh, for themselves, leave alone anything else, reach those people and create diagnostic infra that look, today you have science, today you have a platform that not only does X, Y, Z, but it also does your TB, it also does your HIV testing, it also does your hepatitis, et cetera, et cetera. In my travels the world over, Bobby, believe me, I have seen that the diseases are common, the requirements of those 60, 70% people are common. The needs are common. The disconnects are common, which is so, so unfortunate. And the conditions are also common. We just need people to be given a wake up call and say, hey, look, enough is enough. The pandemic has taught us a thing of two. Let us learn from it and implement. Because you don't know, Bobby, that this simplistic, I'm quoting, quote unquote, simplistic tropical diseases can actually be your next pandemic. As The pandemic taught us a great lesson. The pandemic hit all of us. When I said all of us, it hit the global south as much as it hit the global north. And therefore, probably it came into focus because the global north does not really want to be hit that badly. So it gained focus and there was a lot of clamor and a lot of activity, billions of dollars spent. And the good part is we were able to curb the spread, the rampant spread of the pandemic amidst all the variants that the pathogen started evolving into. And today, hopefully, even though it is not completely gone, it is a much less virulent form of the pathogen. Fast track to TB and then HIV. TB is a historical disease as we have all claimed over the years. It's been there for thousands of years. Yet it has not gained that quote unquote popularity. One of the dominant reason is that it is not as rampant in the global north as it is in the global south. Unfortunate but true. Unfortunate, but the inequities still very much exist. Therefore, even though every year we lose more people to TB than probably whatever we have lost in the entire pandemic, there is not much you and cry. Simply because overall, lives in the global south does not matter, does it or does it? So the pain points are there. Tragically, you will see that everything that is getting done or at least being tried out to try and curb the spread of the disease, putting diagnostics in place, bringing out the new drugs, providing the resources for the same, are dominantly being pushed by people in the global north. Again, a travesty of fate. 
at people who do not have the disease have all the powers of making decisions for people who have the disease. So today we know that there is a lot of TB even in the urban settings. But it is the 70%, like in a country like India and majorly all the LMIC countries, the people who unfortunately have these diseases are the economically underprivileged, people living in the last mile, as we keep saying. Those are the people who have the disease, who do not know they have the disease because they do not get the diagnosis and therefore pass a life which is terrible and then the number of deaths and the mortality rates which are registered and many a time they don't their deaths do not even get registered so even like the numbers that we look at as number of people who have died probably would at some point in time need to be reworked because most of the deaths do not even get reported so the question is where do we need the diagnostics and if 70 percent of our population do not get appropriate diagnostics the commonsensical response is make diagnostics available to those 70% because the 30% already have it. Right. So everything or anything that we do in our own lives has a direct connect with our communities, you like it or not. Some are not very easily seen or not very easily expressed and many others are very, very uh, easily identifiable and expressed. But at so welcome friends to another episode of uh, Put People First theme series, which we are running in the lead up to 25th International AIDS Conference in Munich, Germany. So uh, in the lead up to AIDS 2024, we have amongst us someone who we really value uh, for the passion and the commitment uh, of that person, especially to uh, find people uh, in the global south uh, with the best of tools and technologies, especially those who are most likely to be left behind. Uh, it is really important uh, because the United Nations General Assembly this year, there will be a special session on antimicrobial resistance. We can never end AMR, prevent AMR unless we find people accurately with, the, with different diseases and conditions and put them on the right treatment. And um, so we have amongst us someone who has really championed this cause worldwide, uh, Mr. Sumit Mitra. He is the president of international sales at Molbio Diagnostics. Molbio, many of you may be familiar, but I think more will be familiar with the one of its products called TrueNet, which is the only WHO uh, recommended point of care decentralized lab independent and battery operated molecular test being used in over 70 countries. A lab on the wheels is another, uh, I think you call it L-O-W, lab on wheels. <laughs> no, it's another high uh, uh, because it takes best of tools and technologies right at the doorstep of the people or as close as possible to the community uh, uh, in so many different uh, places. So thanks a lot, Sumit, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts and views and which is always from my own heart. Thank you. Thank you, Sumit. So uh, we will ask you about the put people first, uh, the the question. But before that, let us dive deep into, um, you know, we really want to get your insights on, uh, um, uh, like, there's so much more when, we, uh, you know, we are, we are, I'm not a medical doctor, but like when I see the numbers as a human being, uh, and uh, I feel that there is so much more we could have done better in terms of, you um, finding people with TB and HIV uh, and other conditions like hepatitis, for example, or cervical mm -hmm. cancer, for example, so many other conditions early, accurately, and link them to care. We could have saved lives so much more. Uh, probably a lot more should have been done in the global south. 167,000 people died of TB and HIV co-infection alone. This was so much preventable, so much doable. We have the tools. When we say TB is preventable, it is not for uh, 10.6 million people who get the disease every single year. And of course, like uh, no one needs to die of TB, but 1.3 million people died of TB uh, last year. So uh, uh, your opening remarks. So my first observation on uh, something that you missed, uh, mentioned that you are not a doctor. 
Let me start off by saying that doctors are first human beings and then doctors. So we are all in it together, whether we are doctors, medical professional, healthcare professional, or people as passionate as you who have been, you know, picking up the cudgels on the behalf of all these uh, affected communities globally. First things first, the pandemic taught us a great lesson. The pandemic hit all of us. When I said all of us, it hit the global south as much as it hit the global north. And therefore, probably it came into focus because the global north does not really want to be hit that badly. So it gained focus and there was a lot of clamor and a lot of activity, billions of dollars spent. And the good part is we were able to curb the spread, the rampant spread of the pandemic amidst all the variants that the pathogen started evolving into. And today, hopefully, even though it is not completely gone, it is a much less virulent form of the pathogen. Fast track to TB and then HIV. TB is a historical disease as we have all claimed over the years. It's been there for thousands of years. Yet, it has not gained that quote unquote popularity. One of the dominant reason is that it is not as rampant in the global north as it is in the global south. Unfortunate, but true. Unfortunate, but the inequities still very much exist. Therefore, even though every year we lose more people to TB than probably whatever we have lost in the entire pandemic, there is not much you and cry. Simply because overall, lives in the global south does not matter, does it or does it? So the pain points are there. Tragically, you will see that everything that is getting done or at least being tried out to try and curb the spread of the disease, putting diagnostics in place, bringing out the new drugs, providing the resources for the same, are dominantly being pushed by people in the global north. Again, a travesty of fate, that people who do not have the disease have all the powers of making decisions for people who have the disease. A little bit, a little bit of it seems cynical. I will not be cynical. I will just be practical. I have spent 32 years in the in vitro diagnostics field. I want to break healthcare into some very simplistic kind of way. To me, healthcare is all about two things. First, diagnostics. Second, therapeutics. And two are absolutely intricately linked. If you don't have the appropriate, timely, accurate, and correct diagnosis, you, everything that comes subsequent, that is the therapy, follow-up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, will also be inadequate, inappropriate. So the diagnostics is of a critical importance, yet for over decades, diagnostics have not really got the prominence that it always deserved. But thanks to the pandemic, things are changing and diagnostics is finally being looked upon as a critical, if not the critical step in mitigating all the disconnect, all the lacuna, all the uh, all the things that you mentioned that there is and there is it is going to be there for a long time. So diagnostics is of the first importance. We and I personally, having been in diagnostics throughout my professional career, can vouch that with proper diagnostics, with early diagnostics, with correct diagnostics. 50 to 60% of your problems are solved because everything that happens later all happens for the good of the public. Mortality rates are decreased. Healthcare outcomes that become much that much better. And overall, the social impact of good overall healthcare has a tremendous chain effect across the society. Now the question is. 
where do we need this diagnostics? Again, unfortunately, the diagnostics world itself has been divided into a 70, 30 kind of a structure where 30% of the affluent, 30% of the haves, 30% of the people in the urban uh, settings have all the diagnostics that is required. But you know what, Bobby? That 30% may not be having the diseases that we are talking about, the TBs and the tuberculosis, even though today we know that there is a lot of TB even in the urban settings. But it is the 70% like in a country like India and majorly all the LMIC countries, the people who unfortunately have these diseases are the economically underprivileged, people living in the last mile, as we keep saying. Those are the people who have the disease, who do not know they have the disease because they do not get the diagnosis and therefore pass a life which is terrible and then the number of deaths and the mortality rates which are registered. And many a time they don't, their deaths do not even get registered. So even like the numbers that we look at as number of people who have died probably would at some point in time need to be reworked because most of the deaths do not even get reported. So the question is, where do we need the diagnostics? And if 70% of our population do not get appropriate diagnostics, the commonsensical response is make diagnostics available to those 70% because the 30% already have it. So my initial take, uh, Bobby, and it, which is also the a theme of our discussion and this entire panel is put people first. Which people are we even talking about? Have we identified those people? Who are those marginalized people who have no health care? Forget about diagnostics. And today, if we have been able to take a few steps forward, I would say if those 60, 70% are the identified people who do not have adequate health care, let us reach out to them. Let us reach out to them with technologies that are adequate, that are at, at go, as good at and at par with the very best because Living a healthy life need not be a political thing. It is a fundamental right of any individual. It is his or her body. It is your body versus my body, Bobby. And if your body deserves the treatment that it deserves, so does mine. Whether you're in the global south or in the global north, this one fundamental right is the same for every human on this planet yeah thank you so much uh, for, for these uh, you know for these words and it is so so many issues which you have raised and i really hope that uh, you know uh, they get more attention because they are seldom spoken by uh, and they're seldom and the seldom spoken and very very rarely addressed these are difficult issues and these are very uncomfortable truths which you have spoken about too i think uh, it is really important that when, when people living with hiv they need uh, one of the uh, uh, treatment outcome goals should be that they should all of them should be virally suppressed. If I am living with HIV, I need to be virally suppressed. Then only I will be able to lead a normal life and my risk of transmission will be zero as WHO says zero risk of transmission from a person who is virally suppressed as well as my risk of TB and other opportunistic infections diseases will also be so low. Point here is that if you look at the viral suppression rates, in so many countries, they are um, they are really like we could have done so so much better. But um, but uh, also, what about other co-infections? For example, hepatitis. If you go to populations where um, in so for for instance in Central Asia and Eastern Europe, you find a lot of hepatitis, um, or HIV, TB uh, co-infections in the same human being. So there are and there can be so many other conditions. So can, any 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 insight before the AIDS 2024 opens, how can we make sure that a human being which may have HIV, but that person may have many other conditions? So the, the, the goal of the healthcare program should be to diagnose all those conditions early and accurately and, uh, and take care, especially when people living with HIV are living longer, thankfully, 
and we can't afford to lose these gains which are made by the antiretroviral therapy program and other care and support programs. No, absolutely. I think I I will uh, I will go back to my student days when we were in school and colleges when the uh, the the actual hepat uh, HIV thing was uh, kind of uh, kind of blowing up globally, and we've come a long way. And I'm very very happy to say that uh, with HIV, uh, perhaps because HIV was also uh, happening in to an extent in the global north. I, I remember uh, Arthur Ashe, the famous American tennis player who actually died of uh, uh, HIV. The Arthur Ashe. Uh, stadium in US. So there are these very, very prominent people who are infected with HIV. Uh, Magic Johnson, the famous basketball player who actually was invited, uh, infected with HIV. So the fact that so many prominent uh, people in the global north uh, infected with HIV, but who then came out and championed the cause of the disease uh, was a step in the right direction. So over a period of time, you would have seen, as I rightly mentioned, that uh, better and better drugs have uh, de uh, developed. When we were in schools and colleges, uh, the HIV, once you're infected, you are actually given some sort of a death, death warrant, you know, that your life is going to be limited. But today, uh, people, we, uh, we have people with living with HIV for ages, and so good to know that because our ART treatments have become uh, that much more simpler, better drugs are available for the uh, people who are uh, unfortunately uh, living with the uh, disease, et cetera. But then absolutely uh, spot on to say that we need very, very similar uh, outcomes for all the other diseases that we have. So there is a great, great, uh, uh, if, we can, if I can use that word, uh, uh, partnership between HIV and tuberculosis. Now, HIV, as we all know, uh, breaks down the body's immunity, and TB, as we all know, is an opportunistic infection. Now, the infection manifests itself in a big way in an immunocompromise or any body that has its immune system compromised, which is what HIV does. So even though you get infected with HIV, deaths occur because of TB. So there is a complete uh, link between the two, and in major uh, of the African uh, continent, especially the sub-Saharan African region, the maximal uh, cases of HIV-TB co-infections tell you that people get infected with HIV, but at the end of the day, they die of TB. So all the more reason that we should have tools again right at the doorstep of those 60, 70 percent of those marginalized last mile people, communities which hitherto would never had the opportunity to get quality diagnostic solutions uh, for themselves, leave alone anything else, reach those people and create diagnostic infra that look, today you have science, today you have a platform that not only does X, Y, Z, but it also does your TB, it also does your HIV testing, it also does your hepatitis, et cetera, et cetera. Now, Bobby, I come from the northeast of the country, as you know. A uh, few years back, and my dad used to uh, serve in the government of Arunachal Pradesh, that is bordering China. And I have had some brilliant early childhood memories of Arunachal Pradesh. Now, those places were places of headhunters. And only piece of cloth that they would wear is the loin cloth just to keep their private parts covered. And the Gaubura, or the headman of the village, was identified by the number of skulls, the human skulls that he had on his table. I have seen those with my own eyes. Now, to just think, Northeast has tremendous cases of hepatitis. One of the major reasons is alcoholism. You have a lot of alcohol-related hepatitis there. Now to do or NAT or the PCR was unimaginable even before the pandemic. So samples, as you rightly said, would be transported to either Guwahati, Calcutta, or Delhi. And after two weeks, a report, a piece of paper would go back to them. Now we don't know what happened to the sample in the interim today, how positively that scenario has changed. In Arunachal Pradesh, with the availability of the NAT machines and MolBio playing its part. That same NAT test can be done within an hour. 
within an hour, the patient can be identified as to what viral load he or she has an immediate antiretroviral treatment or antiviral treatment, as the cases may be, can be started. And you know what, Bobby? The earlier you detect, the correctly you detect, as you rightly said, and as soon as you start the appropriate therapy, chances are, and this is backed by science, that his or her life thereafter will be much more dignified simply because the recovery will be faster, and as the recovery becomes faster, the social stigma, the social uh, ostracization, the social inability to recognize the pain points the person is going through all diminish. Because as you recover fast, your demeanor, your external demeanor changes because you don't feel that much of moroseness. You don't feel that much of diseased state of mind, as we call it and you look cheerful, you say, yes, I'm undergoing treatment. I'll be all right in a couple of months. So you're absolutely right. The idea is to create diagnostics infra that enables you to test over a multiple uh, uh, you know, number of pathogens, multiple, multiple number of pathogens, all relevant, all so much more relevant because we are a tropical country and all ma major LMIC countries are within the tropics. And in my travels the world over, Bobby, believe me, I have seen that the diseases are common. The requirements of those 60-70% people are common. The needs are common. The disconnects are common, which is so, so unfortunate. And the conditions are also common. We just need people to be given a wake-up call and say, hey, look, enough is enough. The pandemic has taught us a thing of two. Let us learn from it and implement. Because you don't know, Bobby, that this simplistic, I'm quoting, quote unquote, simplistic tropical diseases can actually be your next pandemic. As uh, the, as the uh, president director of the union, uh, Mr. Peter Sands, uh, sometime back said, that for all that you care, you may see malaria to become the next pandemic. So absolutely agree with you that science has to reach the people. Science has got to be people-centered. There is no, there cannot be any debate on this. There just cannot be any debate on this. And as is today the championing of the cause, that we need science to be people-centered. We need science to be disseminated across the communities. We need communities to stand up and demand no more request. The request is gone. As I said, it's my body. And if it's my body, my body demands that I get the best of science. Otherwise, why, why have science at all if the benefits of science does not reach the people for, which, for whom it was uh, done in the first case? Yeah, right. Totally, totally agree with you. You know, like uh, it's so important that uh, the benefits of science um, must reach the people and uh, without any delay we are we have done we have probably done a very bad job in converting the uh, scientific gains and achievements and breakthroughs into public health gains so, uh, before we let you go uh, is your final thoughts any any comments as well as uh, what does put people first mean to you although you have responded to that but uh, any any final thoughts uh, yeah just uh, indulge me I have gone through that paper that you were citing the same day treat of the HEP and the outcomes that, and I got uh, in touch with one of the authors who is uh, Manipuri, who is now based in Bangkok. And one of the principal investigators, Dr. Uh, uh, Thuiba Singh from Bobina Diagnostics Imphal. Uh, I know him in person and Bobby, I have worked that area right up to Chura Chandpur, which is the hotbed of HIV because of intravenous drugs young adults, I have worked there myself way back under the project Shalom, uh, the Society for HIV, et cetera, there uh, with the Emanuel Foundation. So I got in touch with them. And yes, you're right. Uh, it is very commonsensical because once you have the science and you put them into use, these are the kind of outcomes that you will get. And thanks to uh, organizations like FIND, uh, they are now coming into the forefront and uh, 
foraying into these areas and pushing people to figure out the benefits of science. Uh, so that is a great thing to see. And I could feel it. Uh, my my, I had I had good goosebumps because I remember the early 90s when I used to visit Churachandpur. I have stayed there for weeks, training the people how to run the ELISA test for the HIV, etc. So yeah, I have uh, seen that article and I fully identify myself with what is being said there. Uh, as a last uh, uh, comment, Bobby, I think the uh, people like us. People like you, people like uh, everybody in their individual capacities, Dr. Sachdeva and all the people in the government, in the public health, we all need to sit up. Look, anything great that needs to be achieved cannot happen if we all do not collaborate. So the word for me is collaboration. Collaboration in a big way, in a very, very big way rather, between private enterprise and the governments of the day. And we should have good intermediators because you know there is also a element of distrust because the public health all many a time i'm not generalizing but my feeling is many a time they look at the public enterprise as being only for profit it is not like that it is not like that of course yes a public private enterprise will need to have profits because otherwise it will not be able to sustain over the long term but there are private enterprises which are driven by a much larger community cause. And I think uh, uh, I would go a step further and say that Mulbio is one such company. And I'm sure there are others too. So the, the, the thing is that we need a much higher and a much larger and a much deep-rooted collaboration based entirely on trust to ensure that the development within the private sector is put into use by the public health experts across countries, wherever they are needed. And I can assure you that companies like ours are always alive, always dynamic to ensure or make changes uh, with requirement, which would be in sync with the requirement uh, uh, for the public good. At the end of the day, again, I will come back to the theme. Look around us, you, me, doctor, engineer, entrepreneurs, bright scientists, bright teachers. We are all doing our job for, the be for bettering somebody else's career and ours in the process. So as soon as a human being is born, the birth itself gives the element of purpose. The purpose is do something for your brothers and sisters as you gain more and more. And that's why there is this so many saying in every religion, they say the same thing that, you know, Atiti Deva Bhava in, in Hindi or in Sanskrit, look after your love thy neighbor as you would love that yourself in the Christian uh, element. Again, the Northeast that I come from, this was the gospel truth that we lived by. So everything or anything that we do in our own lives has a direct connect with our communities, you like it or not. Some are not very easily seen or not very easily expressed, and many others are very, very uh, easily identifiable and expressed. But at the end of the day, there is no doubt that as from the time we are born till the time we leave our uh, earthly abode, we are actually meant to do something for the other person. So going to the people, making it people-centric or people-centered might be a theme of the current generation if, if it really can be called so. But this is actually the fundamental cause of how we have evolved over the years as human beings, that each one for the other. So my thought is that, yes, we have the theme, we identify with the theme, but facts, always with action speak more than any words. So probably we will need to do much, much more than what we've been currently doing. 
thank you a very strong message again uh, sumit and uh, so true in all in so many cultures when you were talking about atithi devabhav and um, the gospel you know and and the english version i was reminded of ubuntu in africa like you know humanity to Correct. others or like i think it means like i am what i am because of who we all are and i think that connect is so so is so important and that uh, you know getting grounded into the very basics um and of course like that that humanity is, is so 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 deeply true all the best to you uh, sumit and uh, uh, have a great conference in germany in munich and we look forward to hearing more how uh, of, of the impact which you people all had thanks a lot thank you thank you very much talking to you is always a pleasure let's do this together thank you very much bobby have a good day